Recently, I spent three hours uh, with the executive vice president of one of the three major television stations, companies, whatever you call them, who will remain nameless. And uh, we spent about three hours. They, she'd flown out here to the coast to discuss with me doing a primetime television series on child suicide. And um, when we got all through with it, I, I proved to her convincingly that you could not address the issue of child suicide as an independent subject. That is, you had to look at the total fabric of what is happening to the child in the United States today in order to understand this phenomenon uh, of uh, this epidemic increase of child suicide. And we know now that the National Institute of Mental Health says that child suicide reaches all the way down to age three. Uh, that, uh, but that the American public as a whole never, they can't conceive of the fact that children at age three will take their own life out of their state of despair and anxiety. And we attribute all these early suicides always to accidents. Well, you ought to read their, their in-depth research into this. It's kind of interesting. Now, when I got into all this, we realized there was no way to, to, um, to discuss it as an issue without discussing the total issue of the American child and what's happening right now. And uh, by the time we got into that, we had ended up in a position, she looked at it all finally, and we've, we're still, it's still in the discussion stage, what, several months later. And she said, it has to be prime time. We can't let this happen on cable or something like that. And she said, we'll never get the backers for prime time because this steps on everybody's toes. <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. So to take any one issue out of what's happening today uh, is kind of hard. But now I'm not going to get into, uh, into all the negatives. Let me say there are two things happening today. I said the same thing last year, didn't I? I'm sure I did. That there, there are two big forces moving right now. And one is research into who we are. That's opening on, a, on, on an, a breathtaking, marvelous, awesome level. At the recent meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the president of the, uh, that august body said, from now on, the brain is the real frontier of all research for all the sciences. We know that microbiologists, uh, biochemists, physicists galore, and everyone else is jumping into brain research. Why? Because therein lies literally the key to everything. Uh, I think of my, my real change from years ago when I used to like Pregram's hol holographic theory, you know, ah, oh, the brain is a ho mini hologram of this great hologram. You know where, where his error was? He had it backwards. That out there, whatever it might be, is simply in some way uh, an expansion of what's going on in here. And brain research is really awesome in its dimensions, what's happening in it now. And we're beginning, I'll tell you what has to take place from brain research, is we have to come up with a new paradigm. That is a new view of who we are as human beings, and that's all. Now, and this, this paradigm is awesome. Now, one of the reasons that physicists are embracing Eastern psychology, and you hear that all the time, is that all these new researches into physics and brain and so on, are simply uncovering what the ancient sages of the East talked about ad nauseum. In fact, they filled up great volumes talking about it. And this is not just games playing. There's a direct correlation between uh, many, many, many of the ancient writings of the East and what is now being discovered in our sciences. And out of this is coming a new paradigm, a new model of who we are. And it's tremendously optimistic. At the very same time that this marvelous optimistic curve is rising, we have this other curve rising, which is the result of the other paradigm that we've been under for way too many centuries. And it is leading us, as you know, right toward total disaster on every possible hand. And I say, if pollution doesn't get us, the bomb doesn't get us, and so on and so forth, what's happening to children is going to get us far faster than all the rest of those things. And yet, it, to me, it's a time of enormous optimism. And I like to share some of that optimism with you, as well as sharing with you at least one little item uh, the, some of the disasters that are, are happening to us today. I was recently in Japan and uh, there for a couple of weeks of, of um, lectures. I was asked to address the issue more often than anything else of the breakdown in childhood. That is, their, their serious epidemic increases of suicide, autism, schizophrenia in their children, uh, the serious breakdown in family life, and above all, the thing that really has Japan shook right now 
is the serious, far more serious outbreak of violence in their schools. I mean a nasty, vicious kind of violence that's going on. And you see, there has never in the whole history of Japan been any civil uh, um, disobedience, or what would you call it, incivility among their own populace toward each other. So they just don't even know how to cope with all this. And so um, I was having a long conversation with Ibuka San. Now, Ibuka San is the president and founder of Sony Corporation. We had a, about a two and a half hour conversation. It was published in the Japanese edition of Omni magazine. And Ibuka San is way up in his 80s, way up there. He's most, one of the most bright, brilliant, vital, vigorous, on the ball alert people I've ever met in my life, in spite of his age. And uh, the other thing, he had just finished publishing a new book on the uh, reshaping of Japanese education. And he's a great promoter of my books. Even this new book, which is available out here, has already been translated into Japan and is coming out both in serial form in a magazine and in, in paperback. Uh, and Ibuka-san had this interesting thing to say, which I want to share with you because I want to get right to this issue as quickly as I can tonight. I can't get to any issue quickly, as you'll see. Uh, <laughs> and he said to me, until America came in here into Japan, a hundred years or so ago with their cannon and opened us up to the West, whether we liked it or not, saying in effect, open up or we'll blow your heads off, you know. Uh, he said, until America came in here and opened us up to the West, in spite of all of its inequities and injustices of a feudal system, the Japanese people lived, quote now, lived from their hearts in harmony with nature and each other. Since you opened us up to the West, he said, we have been living more and more out of our intellects until now we're moving towards suicide. Isn't that an interesting comment from a very old and very brilliant man? Living out of their intellects, and he points toward his head, instead of out of the heart and moving towards suicide. Okay, so what I'd like to share tonight, in this new paradigm that's arising, we're going to find this that the development of intellect is a, a preliminary form of the development of a true human intelligence. Intellect is designed to unfold for its development somewhere in adolescence. Probably, as, as Piaget said, from about 11 to 15 is the prime time for the development of intellect. And intellect is a highly refined binary form of logic that refers everything back uh, to past process and looks ahead and tries to predict and control the flow of events in relate to, uh, relation to a future projection. Most of intellect's re re uh, reference to past is, is uh, generally resentment, and its reflection on the future is generally um, anxiety and fear. Uh, intellect f flips back and forth between those two things. One thing I'll, I'll throw out right now about intellect, as the highest form of intelligence which we currently develop, Intellect cannot, by its very nature and structure as a logical process, ever deal in the present moment. Intellect is always flicking back and forth between what has happened and what might happen. How we can take things apart and, and put them together in new ways, and so on and so forth. Now, the other thing we find is that intellect and intelligence are not the same thing. That, that is, sounds like a, a straining at points. Let me just mention that any ethologist on Earth will tell you that all species have within them a tremendous intelligence for operating for their own well-being. That if any species suddenly started operating against the well-being of the species and the members of the species, we would immediately say this species has no intelligence or it's lost its natural survival intelligence. Okay? This, any ethologist will tell you. We know that any living organism of any sort is possessed of an enormous intelligence. Louis, uh, Louis Thomas, in The Lives of a Cell, some of you surely know that, he speaks of the incredible intelligence of a single cell and how, of course, it achieves its fruition by operating intelligently with all the rest of the cells. Now, you have never heard any, anyone ever refer to the intellect of an animal. Have you ever said, my dog has such a great intellect? Have you? No. You'll hear somebody say, that's the most intelligent dog. That horse has tremendous intelligence. But no one ever says an animal has intellect. Why? Intellect is uh, uh, um, involved in 
semantic logic of a, of a word nature and a high level of abstract logic, which has to do with kind of a dichotomizing or polarizing of experience in the kind of plus, minus, either, or, etc. and putting it together in new ways. That's why you don't hear it from animals. Animals cannot and do not develop intellect. It's a purely human venture. On the other hand, let's look at one other little thing. Right now, in all technological countries, all the educational systems, without doubt, this is certainly the case in America, are designed on producing a very high level intellect. An, an intellect which can be of genius level, uh, brilliant beyond all measure, but an intellect nevertheless. Now I'll throw out this, and I'm sure I said this last time. I think I started with this last time. I was here, something about this building brings it out. Uh, and that is right as of now, as we sit here, there are 500,000 of our major intellects produced by all of our educational systems around the world. 500,000 scientists, which is the highest level of all intellectual production we have, and what all the schools are, are aimed really toward producing in the last analysis, is the scientific mind. There are 500,000 scientific minds in the total planet, speaking all of its language, involved 100% of their time in the production of armaments. They already have enough armaments to destroy all life on earth 10 times over, but at the end of the decade, 50 times over. Now, I simply present to you that this is a brilliant, genius-level intellect operating totally outside intelligence, because intelligence cannot move against the well-being of the species. It's impossible. Otherwise, you have you have defied the very, I mean, you have, you have um, I'm sorry, the very term intelligence, which means the ability to move for the well-being of the species. So we are, we, are, we are now producing an intellect devoid of intelligence. And I'm not trying to be funny. Think about it for a little bit, and you'll suddenly realize it's true. So I'd like to share with you uh, the, the uh, kind of a, uh, another look, sort of stepping one point over like Edward de Bono would talk about, you know, to escape our own intellectual trap, and just look at these two words, intelligence and intellect, on, on a little level, a different level. Um, I've got some slides. I use slides because they help concretize functions. But bear in mind with my slides that they're diagrams. These are diagrams from, from my new book, by the way. Don't buy one copy, buy three or four. And these, these slides um, represent, they're representational of functions. Now bear in mind that sketches like this or diagrams always betray the function toward which they point. Do you understand what I mean by that? A sketch can't possibly uh, present the enormous richness and complexity of that toward which they are pointing, but that's the best we can do. So hit the first one. Now, who's doing it? Tell me your name, honey. Pat. Oh, well, that's easy enough. Okay. Now, first of all, and I'm not going to dwell on this one, but to establish a little credibility about it, because the credibility gap with things I say gets awfully steep, so I throw out something that might help it a little bit. But I have really been invited by a lot, uh, a half dozen at least, university physics departments to come and lecture on the relationship between quantum mechanics and brain process. Uh, this is the result of a group of phys phys physicists, friends of mine, working me for about six years to try to give me at least the faintest little idea of what's involved in complementarity theory and quantum mechanics. And at least finally I got it so I could grasp enough of it that I could see how it fit in with everything else. So I'd like to just pass that on to you. Now here is the wildest kind of a model in the world that certainly betrays an awesome process, and that's quantum mechanics. In a nutshell, what the quantum mechanics or people are saying, and this is a result primarily of Bell's theorem, as well as the complementarity theory of Niels Bohr and all, is that the universal process, or this creative process that produces things, particles, atoms, molecules, cells, bodies, suns, solar systems, universes, and so on, that, that, you, that creative process is resonating its thingness, or its physical process, out of what we can only call fields of energy, and the word field is only a metaphor. There's no such animal as a field, but they've got to express it some way, so they speak of fields. They could say states, if they like. States or fields of energy that are, for one thing, non-localized. Now, that makes everybody uncomfortable. What do you mean non-localized? Well, they don't have any place. They aren't in a place. They're just states. And the next thing is that they're non-existent, because existence means to be set apart from, and these states are all a single unit, uh, unit or whole. And uh, the other is that the, uh, 
the state's light, not out there, or the spaces they represent, not out there, but in here. And you say, well, where is in here? Well, in here is just not out there. So there are some paradoxes here. Nevertheless, we know this, and I'm just going to throw it out. This is old hat stuff. Even if Paul Violette, who just attended a workshop of mine up in, in Portland, Oregon, and I, I love him. We've been running across each other for many years. And even if his new theory it, it holds out, it will fit into and complement the overall quantum mechanical process in some way. They're going to marry those two together because I think Paul Violette is really a very great genius. But to get back to this, what they're saying is that any particle that exists, making up an, a molecule, an atom, or anything else, is resonating out of a waveform of energy. Now, the way, word waveform is itself simply a um, uh, um, metaphor, it's just trying to express something. But out of this state that it doesn't exist, out of this potential of energy, the particle manifests instant by instant as what they call a display of the energy. A quick analogy, on a very bad analogy, is here's your television station. Here's your studio. Here's your actor in your studio, read, or whoever it is, reading the evening news or whatever it might be. Now, we take that energy and we transform that basic energy into another energy we can call a kind of a potential energy. And then through the great towers and all those things, we send that energy out in what we assume are waves. That's all you can do, you see. And then we set up a machine which does what? It collapses the wave to particle form, literally. That's what it does. And the particle appears here on the screen of your set. Now, if you'll notice the particle, by the time the eye registers the particle, the particle has disappeared and been replaced by another one. You can never find, your consciousness can never register the exact instant when the particle is appearing on the screen. By the time you register it, it's been replaced a dozen times or hundreds or maybe thousands of times by another particle. You understand that? So these particles in their constant display or resonating back and forth out of a, a hypothetical wave state, that's all you can say, hypothetical wave state, Give us what? An idea of what's going back here, on back here, in the first stage. Got it? Real simple. Now, this bears some vague notion, I mean some vague uh, similarity, to quantum mechanics. Right now in this room, how many hundreds of these wave fields are there going through us at all times? How many broadcasting stations do you have around here? Thousands in Los Angeles, right? And everyone I'm sending out what we say are waves. Let's take a cubic foot of, of space and cut it right out, you know, and look at it. You'll never find a wave. From here to eternity, you'll never find a wave. So, but we have to assume that the waves are there. They are implied simply because if we set up a certain kind of a machine, it will collapse what we assume to be the wave and the particles will appear. That is very roughly what's going on with quantum mechanics. You have four levels of energy. Where the particles appear, you've got your final reality that we call the explicit order or the ex explicit world. That's which manifested out here in, in particles, in things. Uh, you have your machine for translating that, which has to itself be made of particles, of course. Then you've got your wave field that has within it all the implications of everything that's going to happen. So we refer to that as the implicate order of energy, okay? And then we've got the pure potential energy before it even takes on its implications here, and that we call the simply the pure potential or causal energy. And then finally, what's here in, this, in, this, in the studio? That's the genesis of the whole act, right? Okay, so in the waveform, in this business, in quantum mechanics, they say we have the genesis of the whole process, uh, which is a non-moving form of energy. That is, it's simply a steady state of consciousness, and it gives rise to waveforms which are pure potential and bring about causality. And those then take on the implications of the kind of formal structures that are going to happen when those impl implicated or implications collapse to form particles. Now, that means this. First of all, if you go to the center of any single particle that will ever be created, you'll find the same center you find in any other particle. If you go into the heart of any atom on Earth, you'll find the same center that you find in any other. I mean, there's only one center. And all these other effects are what we can call on the surface of the display which it makes. So that means if you go into the heart of the solar system, into the heart of a galaxy, into the heart of your own system, any other, you find exactly the same center. All right. The other thing is, I'll throw out one little other thing, and I'm not going to dwell on this, my favorite subject. That's not true, it's one of my favorite subjects. But I'll throw out one more little thing, and that's Bell's theorem. And here I'll use the one part of it I can understand. And that is, if you take two of these particles, 
You know, a, a particle in isolation only lasts a hundredth of a billionth of a second. That's the things they're working with. They only are there for a flash of a second. And then they write whole books about it and make all sorts of presumptions about it. But if you take two of these particles and you bring them close enough together, think of that. Take two of these particles that are instant by instant displaying out of wave fields. Take two of these particles and bring them close enough together so they establish a certain spatial proximity. They immediately form a bond. And they begin to resonate around each other. And they form a closed system of relationship. Okay? They form a closed system of relationship. Then you set up a device, and this took 12 years after it was first proposed by John Bell before somebody could actually set up the right laboratory conditions for it. And you break the two particles up after they have formed their closed system of relationship. And you send this one off in this direction and this one off in this direction. They're then traveling apart at approximately the speed of light. Now, you physicists can roll over on the floor and hold your sides laughing uh, over my simplified forms, but it works well enough to get the point across. And they're moving ap apart at approximately the speed of light. Now, you then take an interferometer uh, and you change the angle of spin of this particle over here, let's say, particle A. You're like it's switching its north pole to its south pole. Say you did that to the Earth, you know, fun and games. So we, we're going to switch the particle here. It's change its polarization. Change its angle of spin. Instantly, with no lapse of time, and you're doing nothing at all to this one over here, we know this one over here shifts in a perfect mirroring. Okay, this one changes when this one, when you change this one arbitrarily. No matter how you change this one arbitrarily, this one over here will instantly reflect that change. So they kept stretching this out, making the experiment broader and broader and broader and farther and further apart, and farther and farther apart, and they got this very same result. Okay, so then they do all sorts of high level computations on it. Uh, with computers, and they now make the statement they don't, that they know that you could separate the two particles by an entire universe. So if they're hundreds of quadrillions of light years apart, change the angle of spin of this one, and instantly, with no lapse of time, this one over here changes. Why? Because they have established a bond. A bond. Uh, and a closed system of what? Relationship. What is that closed system? Well, it's simply because of having been brought into proximity with each other spatially, they then suddenly are operating out of the same implicate field of what's called compatible variables that give rise to particles. And that is outside time space. And it's within this implicate field that gives rise to the particles that all relationship is established. And all relationship is maintained. So that the relational energy that holds the particles into their shape, giving us their marvelous bodies and world, all of those relational energies lie outside the particles that they're giving rise to, which means all relationship is non-time space oriented process. Okay, And this relationship that gives rise to these two, since it's outside time and space, you can separate these two by quadrillions of light years, infinite amount of time and space, but they instantly are in communion with each other. Why? Because the communication or the relationship is established out in fields of energy which lie outside time space itself, non-localized energy. Now, from a lot of this, we find people like the Spagna and even John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, Wheeler very carefully broaches the subject because he's got the biggest post in the world, I guess. And but they're saying simply that we now know that quantum mechanics, the effect that gives rise to all the physical universe that we know, that gives rise to all reality, quantum mechanics is simply consciousness itself. Uh, as Bohm and Despagne and others say, we used to talk about energy and matter being equivalent. Now we know that consciousness and energy are equivalent processes. That consciousness can express itself either as energy, pure energy, uh, or as matter according to the kind of display it wants to make, that is the kind of game it wants to, uh, to play. Now, let's go on. Remember this, though, that relationship is established in fields of conscious energy outside the physical processes that are related by those fields. You understand what I mean? So relationship of any sort, relationship is established on levels beyond physical process, outside time and space. Now, let's look at one other little thing. We're going to come back to this tonight, and this will be the only real issue I can, I can cover because our time is real limited. If you take two live heart cells, surely I did this one last time, didn't I, Gina? This is another one of my pets. Take two live heart cells. Now, what's the characteristic of a heart cell? The characteristic of a heart cell, the reason you can't t transplant any other cells into the heart or take a heart cell and transplant it into another part of the body 
They're absolutely unique in all of nature. There are cells that contract and expand like this all the time. Okay, but if you isolate a heart cell out of the heart and keep it alive, it expands and contracts very sporadically and chaotically. It loses its rhythm. Okay, so if you bring two of these heart cells and put them, uh, live heart cells, and put them on a microscopic slide and you look at them through the microscope, you'll see them pulsating very sporadically and out of sync, both with themselves and each other bring them close enough together and at a certain point of physical proximity, not physical proximity, spatial proximity. That is just bring them in into proximity with each other at a certain point and you can bar them with a physical barrier so they can't possibly touch. At a certain point they form a bond and what do they do? They begin to pulsate as a single synchronous unit just like a good heart should. Now, how do they communicate? We know they communicate across the physical barrier one with another. Well, for one thing, you've brought them, once you've brought them into physical or spatial proximity, among other things, they are, in effect, resonating out of the same closed field of relationship, which the physicists call a field of compatible variables, and that then collapses into that particular kind of particle form, and the relationship is then established uh, between the two, and it does, they don't need physical contact. Okay, now just remember this, that the relationship between the two heart cells is established outside the physical properties of the heart cells themselves, okay? And that means, again, that relationship is a non-physical process. It's a subtle energy, to use what the physicists was, uh, uh, call a subtle energy rather than a physical energy. And this, this relational energy determines the way all physical process relates together. Got that? So the way all relationship takes place is outside the actual results which that relationship brings about in the physical world. Okay, now let's move on. Uh, there are four levels, hit the trigger there, Pat. Uh, there are four levels of energy that we find in quantum mechanics, and I'm gonna just have to just throw this out real quick. And each one of these levels of energy is translated by one of the modes of our own brain. When Paul McLean at the National Institute of Mental Health publishes on the triune nature of the brain and, be and behavior, one of the most awesome discoveries in brain research, and I don't know why we don't make much more of a fuss over it, everybody accepts McLean's work, but you can't deny it. I mean, it's just too blatant and obvious. But the, the, the implications of it are far more awesome. We have three brains in our skulls, not one, and they are, as Paul McLean makes perfectly clear, radically distinctly different from each other. And as McLean points out, what is happening, what happens within the skull and whether or not these brains integrate and operate as a single structure or a single, single entrainment, or whether they get all broken up as three systems at war with each other, on that hinges everything. He said, when you find a society that is all breaking up and at war with itself, you can count on it that all is happening is the structures of the brain that we're dealing with are breaking up and not integrating and are at effect at war with each other. What are these three structures? Well, they're one we inherit from the reptiles, developed over hundreds of millions of years. That's our sensory motor brain, the one that gives us our, uh, our experience of an exterior world that we make a motor response to, our sensory motor brain, our physical brain, and that is the oldest of them all, the most stable, but the most contracted and the most limited in possibility, and then superimposed over that, the old mammalian brain that we share with all mammals on Earth, uh, and this is the emotional brain. Very simple. Recent research, which is coming out now very hot and heavy from loads of different sources, proves conclusively that fully 95% of all of our experience that we ever had as egos speaking, interacting with each other and a whole universe, fully 95% of all of this conscious process that we, we have as our self-awareness generates not from the new brain like we thought for 200 years and written all of our textbooks on, that the new brain is almost not involved at all, it's almost peripheral, uh, that it's all generating through this marvelously powerful and intensely complex structure of this middle brain that's called the old mammalian brain and the emotional brain. Now I'm going to get into the characteristics of the emotional brain in just a minute. Uh, this is also the brain we use at night in dreaming and it operates through imagery, not of an external world, but through metaphoric, symbolic imagery. This is a brain that literally thinks through metaphor and symbol. Uh, now this emotional brain uh, is, the, is the target of everything, is the core 
of our whole life process. Now, once nature established these two animal brains, they're very tiny, and for a long time we thought they were just vestigial remains, sort of like an appendix or maybe tonsils hung over from some past age, and they weren't very important. Now we find the whole show seems to be wrapped up in these two, but nature has superimposed over those this huge abs uh, abstract brain, as we call it, the human brain, the neocortex, the neomammalian brain, the one we have so much more of than anyone else except certain dolphins and whales. Now, the new brain has no access to outside information except that which is given it by the emotional brain. Now, what do they mean by emotion then? Emotion means relationship. Without separation and relationship between the two, you have no emotion. Emotion then is the quality of the state of relationship that's established. Just think of that for a minute, okay? So the emotional brain is the relational brain, which relates everything together. Everything together. We know that the emotional brain relates the whole sensory system into its final units, and it relates the three brains together, and it has a far greater uh, relational process that I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, what about this high new brain? Well, that's the intellectual brain. And not one, but I know of at least half dozen research papers that came from all different parts of the world. There was no collusion. They came over different periods of time, all of which indicate that we use probably no more than 3%, maybe at the most 5% of the totality of the new brain. And that the little bit of the new brain that is used is used entirely on behalf of sensory motor information. Which means the little bit of that new brain that's used up there is all used on behalf of the most primitive brain in our whole structure. Why isn't the other 95 to 97 percent of the new brain used? I'll try to touch on that tonight, but I can only suggest it, and that has to be hypothetical, you understand. And when I get into hypo hypothesis, I'll try to say when, you know, although I do a lot of hypothesizing. So we have these three totally different brain structures. We find that they are unique, different, separate from each other, except as they are tied together through the emotional brain, which is what? The relational brain. The brain that relates the old brain to the abstract brain is that middle brain process. They each have a totally different use of language. Sensory motor language starts in the seventh month in the womb. That's been thoroughly established over a 40-year period. That is, in the seventh month when the child's still in the womb, language learning begins in its first major level of sensory motor. The next is emotional relational, and finally word designation and moving on up into semantic language about age 11. So all of that uh, still, even language learning uh, is uh, divided between three modes. There are three literal uses of language in the body. One sensory motor, one emotional relational, and one intellectual. Uh, each brain uses its own distinct form of imagery. And I'm Karen Coast in Newcastle. I'm sure many of you know far more about this than me, but it's fun to talk about anyway. Uh, the brain, in fact, the recent research, and I only read this I, I can't dig it. I mean, this is just one paper, and I've only read one on this, which states almost categorically that even congenitally blind people think in imagery. That is, the brain, as in its very operations, uses imagery for those operations, even though the, these, of course, cannot be expressed or translated into structures of meaning that can be shared with anyone else because the sensory motor processes of, of expressing that image have broken down in congenitally blind people. But nevertheless, the rest of the brain is operating through imagery. So we know that each of these brains, by the way, controls different glandular systems in the body and has different uh, areas of control and so on and so forth. Now, the whole thing is about these, these three brain structures is that they also each represent a different aspect of that quantum mechanical energy. And this has to be hypothetical at this stage, but I'll, I'll try to defend that statement as we go along. Hit the trigger pad and let's move on. When we, we do know this also that each of these brains, now this is, is beyond any uh, controversy, this is an established, we can say, fact from research, that each of these brains is related to a particular state of consciousness. In order to be awake, you have to activate the reptilian brain and, when you go to sleep at night, you do so by shutting down the gateways here, they call them reticular formations, and shuts off activity in the sensory motor brain, and then you're dreaming. And then you have another, the huge and the most important reticular formation or gateway of the whole brain is there in the dreaming brain. When that shuts down, we go into the deep sleep state in which consciousness is only uh, aware in the, what we call the deep sleep state. Recently, we found, of course, in the fact that each of these brains has a different form of imagery, that the new brain, the one up on top, that is left operative apparently in the state of deep sleep also has its own imagery process. Let's run through what these are. The wake state brain uses an image which we see out here, 
That is, the brain projects it out here on the screen of the mind. And those are images we can interact with the whole sensory system. Just think about that for a minute. That what constitutes your exterior world is an image that can be interacted with the rest of the sensory system and given depth and perception and so on and so forth. Tangibility, smell, taste, touch, and see, and so on. Now, if the images don't need the rest of the sensory system for their completion or their activation, that means there'll be an internal image, imagination. The dictionary says imagination is an image not present to the sensory system, doesn't it? Yeah, that's its quote uh, definition. Image is not present to the sensory system. So images that are created by the brain that do not use an ordinary sensory system then will be produced by that dreaming brain up there. And at night, what are those dreams like? You know, they're all metaphors and symbols. What do we mean by that? Well, they're metaphors. That word comes from the Greek word transference, an image which can stand for something else. You know, and the Freudian analysis says, aha, you know, that stands for all these awful, dark, deep things in you. And the Jungian analysis says, aha, these images stand for all these archetypal images. It depends on who you're talking to, that what kind of metaphor you get. Or they're symbolic. Now, what about by symbols? Those dream images are symbolic in the, that they point beyond themselves and participate in some broader level of activity. You say, we say, ah, that dream symbolized the whole grail episode or something like that. You know, all these great religious symbols and so on that might be in your dreams. All dreaming imagery is metaphoric and symbolic in that sense and fluid. One can be exchanged for another very uh, rapidly and easily. Now, what are the images on which the new brain operates? I always love this one. I love to throw this out and spring it on people. And this just has come out recently in research. I discovered it long before it came out in research and meditation. And I was told about it by my meditation teacher. Uh, uh, even before that. The new brain thinks in pure geometric designs. There are about eight general categories or patterns of geometric patterns by which the new brain thinks that we know of now. Now, when I have experienced these, and anybody can, if you, if you really get into meditation and you learn to control meditation, m meditation, remember, is the ability to maintain an ordinary wake state of consciousness as you move through all the different states of consciousness. So you move into the very deepest of all deep sleep states without loss of your ordinary awareness and simply observe what happens there. And the ability to do that, of course, was sh sh given me sheer grace from my meditation teacher. And I remember when I first began to experience these fields, and they are three-dimensional field structures of geometric patterns. They're incredibly, intensely beautiful. And these have recently been researched. They began to find them cropping up, first of all, in LSD research, I think. But well, these are the images of the high roof brain. In a nutshell, through what we now, we've at least cataloged eight patterns. Now, of course, they're infinitely uh, complex and changing. They never repeat themselves instant by instant. They're always in movement and will never repeat the same patterns. One's a snowflake pattern, one's grids of lines, one's a honeycomb effect, and so on we could go. But these are the patterns out of which all other visual processes are constructed. See, all the other patterns of our experiences are constructed out of visual processes which involve those basic or causal processes. So with a high brain, we have a way of literally analyzing or taking apart and seeing what the underlying structure of all the experiences of the other two brains are. And that is wherein arises our ability for logical analysis, the ability to creatively take things apart, scramble them around and put them together in all sorts of new and novel ways. That's the job of that high root brain up there. Now, each of the brains, as we say, has a different state of consciousness imagery, language, chemical hormones it's connected with, and so on. But they've all got to get together and cooperate, or what do we have? We have chaos. And if the chaos takes place in here, where are we going to find that chaos expressed? Of course, in that experience we have through the reptilian brain, which happens to be our external world. And so we'll find that always expressed out here. Hit the trigger and let's move on. Uh, David Bohm, uh, the, the great protege of Einstein and Oppenheimer, referred to the whole movement of this quantum mechanical energy. Remember that little dot I showed with the waves? That's, of course, not the way it happens at all, but that's a, a metaphor itself of it. And then the, the, the structures. Well, he referred to the four states, explicate, anything made explicit or physical, implicate, the, the fields of energy that give rise to form by doing what? Relating the energies as they collapse into their particle form. He calls that the implicate order, that state of consciousness that has implied within it the kind of structure it gives moment by moment or instant by instant, arising out of waveforms that are pure potential. We know, remember, some of you might remember, that that pure potential wave moves down finally to the where the waves are so compacted. Max Planck 
um, um, computed what would be the energy as the waveform finally moves to the single point from which it all springs. And it comes up with 10 to the 98th power energy units per cubic centimeter of pure empty space that results at that point, which is more energy than can ever be conceived of by all your computers in, in the world on all the physical uh, mass in the whole universe. It's really great power, and, and a lot of people are aware that in quantum mechanical energies, in the shifting of the power of these three systems, you instantly, if you could unfold even the tiniest bit of it, you instantly make atomic energy look like a candle in the sun and child's play. David Bohm and others in Europe have been computing on this, uh, and they now say that they have achieved laboratory vacuum states in which they've gotten down to 10 to the minus 17th power energy units, and, I mean, uh, waveforms, at which point you're moving up to more energy in a single cubic centimeter of empty space than can be computed on in the entire physical universe as it stands. And um, that's why Sophie Roche is very interested in this. A lot of people are very interested in it because whoever could catch on literally to how the brain's operating and translate it into some kind of electronic form out there, immediately your whole nuclear play is child's play. You might as well give those things to the kids to play with because with them we're moving into the really big time. Uh, so thank God help us all, right? Now, then that final point from which the whole show springs, David Bohm refers to that, and Despagne, and a lot of other people. I had a list of about a dozen Nobel laureates who have all quietly admitted this, very quiet, uh, lest they lose their, their grants and tenure. But that final point from which the whole show springs, that center of the universe which lies within any aspect of the universe, they, David Bohm and others refer to it as the realm of insight intelligence. The realm of insight intelligence from which the creative process springs. And of course, they know that it is a single sponda or a single unbroken whole pulsation of energy that can't divide against itself. As a result, the wholeness of it has to be contained within us. Now, Bohm made this proposal a long time ago. He knew by the nature of quantum mechanical energy and the complementarity theory that the totality of the whole movement must be contained somehow with, uh, or other within us. And so, of course, I, I did a little homework on what Bohm was talking about and what Paul McLean was talking about and then saw immediately an immediate correlation with what Piaget had talked about in his 60 years and saw this was the way child development unfolded. And then... I, in my own 10 years experience with Muktananda and now four years, um, I mean several years with Muktananda and four years with Chivalasananda in the field of meditation and literally moving into other states of consciousness, I saw that there was an immediate correlation there as well. I simply put them all together. And I might have bragged about this because I do brag about it. But in two of my four trips to England, uh, David Bowman invited me over and we talked about this for a long time, the relationship between brain structure, quantum mechanics, child development, and general yogic psychology. And that's exactly what you find. You find this absolute corollary between them. And it's, it's so blatant, it's so obvious, I'm amazed that, it's, it, that they, it still hasn't been picked up on a broad level. But of course, if it, once it is picked up on a broad level, we have to shelve nearly all of our ideas that we've been operating under for quite a while. The mechanistic, dualistic universe is already totally dead. Unfortunately, we've got to bury an awful lot of Newton and a, re a lot of these other people insofar as their paradigm is concerned. It is not a mechanistic universe. It is a living dynamic of conscious process. And that's what that's the direction we're moving in right now. And it's terribly exciting. As you know, Bohm calls it the whole movement and that realm of inside intelligence, which we have have to have of necessity within us. Uh, and then each of these brain structures, which which translate a different mode of energy. The most powerful mode of energy is translated by the deep sleep brain, the brain of pure potential, the causal brain, the huge human brain. Unfortunately, we only use about 3% of it on an average. Uh, maybe that's good, huh? And then the implicate order energy that gives, gives rise to the specific formal relationships determining how everything relates together on its physical level. That's, of course, translated by our emotional relational brain. And then what is our weak reptilian brain? I've been challenged by some people, they say I should say contracted, restricted, limited reptilian brain, but it's not necessarily any weaker. Okay, I'll, I'll change that one of these days. But this restricted reptilian brain, which gives us our world out here. Notice that your world out here is far, far more stable than your dreams at night, isn't it? Okay, uh, and it's far less emotional. Your dreams are wildly, extremely emotional generally, from one extreme to the other. 
And then we know, too, uh, that, that um, the most unstable of all are those fields of pure geometric patterns, you see, because they're constantly changing. They'll never repeat themselves in history, in the history of your life. And so we find that the, the higher in energy we go, the, the more we move toward pure creativity and pure power, the greater the power and the less the stability and the more open the possibility. And the more we move toward a, a stable reality that we all deal with, thank God, giving us something tangible, the more restricted and the less the possibilities go. Now, we're going to find that you can take one of these brain systems and radically alter and shift the processes of another and, and change things around. And that's happening all the time. Hit the trigger, Pat, and let's move on. Uh, I'll state very quickly, we know in quantum mechanics, and this is something Paul LaViolette has picked up, too, in his new theory, which I think is going to be wedded to quantum mechanics. How, uh, how do any particles form stable processes is simply repetition of patterns. Once nature establishes a pattern for producing a particular set of particles and their relationships out of a field of energy, then that tends to always replicate. And we find that nature always builds on a previous structure. You never have any new structure appearing in nature that is not built on previous structures or variations thereof. I me an exception to it. I really stand to be corrected, but I haven't to this date. All new patterns of nature are built out of relating old patterns in new ways. So we find how does this whole process unfold by a stimulus response process, literally. The whole thing can be boiled down to a stimulus response process. What is that? The stimulus of the wave fields is some previously established relationship up here on a physical level. And that brings about a response from its corresponding wave field of potential, which gives rise to these particles. And in human intelligence, exactly the same thing unfolds. One, what do you have? What's the time? Is it nine o'clock already? Okay, we're ha halfway marked already. Okay, let's just look at one quick example. Language. Language which starts development in the seventh month in the womb. If the mother's a speaking mother, if she's not a speaking mother and you have no stimulus coming from your particle world, the great potential of language, what uh, Gardner at Harvard calls the language intelligence, the potential of language intelligence, will not unfold in its sensory motor phase until it's given the proper stimulus. Here's the brain of the kid. Okay, here comes the stimulus from the mother's words. That waveform word comes in, and instantly there's a motor response to that from about the seventh month on. The response of the potential system for language occurs only if the stimulus is given. And we find that the neural patterns laid down by this automatic imprinting, no learning, it's an automatic imprint process, from the, from the field of potential language, you can say, or what Gardner calls the language intelligence potential, that unfolding of that is determined totally, 100%, by the nature and the character and the quality of the model that furnishes the stimulus for that potential to unfold through that brain system. And as it unfolds from its potential state into its actualized state within the brain system, it leaves a neural pattern, literally a neural pattern for more and more traffic between potential and actualization. Now, the final pattern building in the brain, or what we'll call the concept of language, or what Piaget would call the structure of knowledge of language, will be determined 100% by the model given out here. Take the child away from a French mama at birth and put him with a German model, and what will you get in your final language structure? German. Put him with Chinese, you'll get Chinese. Japanese, Japanese. Nature could care less. All she ever asks is that the inner potential be given a model out there that represents that potential in its final form, right? Now, the potential for language out of those 50 phonemes, which we know are built in genetically, and the child re uh, responds to each one with a muscular movement from the seventh month on, out of those 50 phonemes that create what we call the field of compatible variables of that potential uh, 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 structure, out of those 50, you can build an infinite number of languages. Infinite number. There's no limit to the number of languages you could build out of those 50 phonemes. And that's totally useless to us. But we must be given one language, at best two, of highly restricted uses of these phonemes in a single language structure out here as the stimulus, and then it unfolds. You see how it does? 
Okay. And so then it will unfold and the field will collapse its infinite variables to the single specific according to the model given. And we'll end up with a highly useful, workable language structure. But then the, the great infinite potential is closed. You know, that potential starts closing uh, in so far as the phonemes are concerned by the ninth month after birth. It's real interesting. We're beginning to uh, tie this thing right down. So the, the flow from potential into actualized form must be brought about by giving the child a model. Now, the model must be ongoing. The model can't just trigger a response from the field of potential built within the genetic system. The model must be ongoing as a constant guide and stimulus for the final self-actualization of it. The model must be ongoing. Now, the model must be ongoing. The model can't just trigger a response from the field of potential built within the genetic system. The model must be ongoing as a constant guide and stimulus for the final self-actualization of it. Not just the activating of the potential into its, into its, into its movement, but the guidance of it until finally the child can self-actualize the potential and it becomes their own process. And they can speak and handle language and so on. Now, I'm throwing that out because exactly the same thing has to do with all development of intelligence. You can't find, and God knows for the many years now, I've been trying to find some way out of this because the implications of it are awful. And that is you can't find any aspect of human intelligence that will unfold unless it's first given its stimulus from an outside source. And when we find people like Feuerstein over in Israel doing that brilliant, brilliant work with severely damaged teenagers, he does it through mediation, what he calls mediated learning. One who can do must do with those damaged children. The one who can do does with them and little, bit, little by little unlocks those potentials that have not been unlocked in any other way. And when Gardner and Graves at Harvard speak of the whole structure of intelligence resting solely and completely on a symbolic metaphoric structure and that the symbolic metaphoric structure cannot develop, the potential for it cannot develop unless the child is given the stimulus of his models out there for its development and who are they? The parents of the child. And when does symbolic structuring begin in the brain? Before the child is one years of age, before the child is a year old. A form of mental operation begins if the child is given the stimulus of it. A form of mental operation begins that no animal on earth, so far as we can tell, can ever involve themselves with pure symbolic metaphoric structuring. And it's awesome because we really leave the whole animal kingdom behind. And at age one, we're moving really into pure creativity, pure creativity, you see, uh, but laying the foundations for all future uh, intelligence provided the model is given for it the process is activated in the child and the model continues as an ongoing stimulus until the child can activate the pro self active actualize the process and it becomes an automatic or an autonomous ability in the child for symbolic learning and so on right down the line now so we find that the whole growth from fields of potentials which we call simply, uh, Gardner is calling these, these intelligences, mathematical intelligence, musical intelligence, spatial intelligence, language intelligence. And he refers to these as, as almost like psychic entities, totally independent of each other, you see. And that each one is kind of a whole perfect process built in genetically, simply awaiting what? It's stimulus from someone out here in the world who can do that, who's perfected it. And that model immediately activates this process within the child and the child imprints to the models. The model doesn't teach the child. The model simply is there to take part in it with the child itself until the child can finally self-actualize the activity. And they have then imprinted according to the nature of the model and it becomes their own capacity. Everything takes place this way. Hit the trigger, Pat, and let's move on. Now, the next thing we find, I'm just giving an overview tonight of the workshop tomorrow. All right. So I'm just leaving out, of course, 99% of it, but this will give you an idea of what we're talking about in this developmental process. When we look at Piaget, this is the next stage of it. And we, we really look into what Piaget says about these 
these different stages of development. Feuerstein argues with Piaget. Everybody's always arguing with him. Everybody's always qualifying him. And he needs to be qualified continually. All of us must be qualified by more research all the time. But the basic underlying observations of those 60 years of brilliant research he did are still valid. About every three and a half to four years, a quantitatively totally new process fires in overnight. A new ability just automatically starts operating in that child, provided they're given the right models and the right stimulus for it, on about three and a half to four years, all the way through. And the whole system is complete by about 15. And the body starts falling apart shortly thereafter. <laughs> now, it peaks, and then things start falling apart. Now, what about these stages of development? In a nutshell, if you look at the characteristics of these, whether you're looking at Bruner, Spitz, Mahler, uh, anybody, any of the, or, or Gardner and his intelligence, his multiple intelligence, whatever it might be, they'll follow roughly what Piaget said. And you'll find that they follow the development of the brain structure itself. And that's, that's what I just love. Hit the trigger, Pat. Uh, we have a, okay, hit the trigger again. That's not the right slide. There we are. This one is not as easy to see. And I would have to modify this slightly. I made this slide about six years ago uh, when I first began to get into McLean's uh, trying brain theory. And I have to modify it slightly, but it's still essentially, it, uh, we'll have to qualify it, but I'm not going to do that now. The first year of a child's life, we know the locus of the child's ego structure. The locus of their awareness is largely reptilian with the rest of the brain, since the brain always must function as a single integrated unit, the rest of the brain is simply cooperating beautifully with the sensory motor system in order to activate the sensory motor system. And so the whole focus of, of awareness, the focus of nature and everything in the first year of life is essentially reptilian. Get the sensory motor system going, it frees consciousness to move out of that single entrainment and we begin the development of the emotional relational structure or the development of ego which follows simply the evolutionary structures of adding each of these hierarchies of brain system themselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? In other words, the child recapitulates the whole evolutionary structuring of brains over hundreds upon hundreds of millions of years. All of it built in in beautifully timed process, and you can't argue with the timing. Boy, there's where we really can nail it down. Somewhere around age four, the... Uh, the system shifts up for the first opening stages of real specific development of the intellectual process. Up until that time, the major focus is on the limbic structure or the emotional relational brain. And the first stages of that development are through an intuitive process wherein the child can bring in information or should be able to bring in information not related to the sensory motor system. That is information from sources other than direct sensory motor uh, forms of information. Uh, Gerald Jampolsky, Eloise Shields, and a, a batch of other researchers have found this unfolds at age four in the child, but is never given any model, never given any stimulus, and disappears or atrophies around about age seven. We find that if each, any of these systems are not activated within their optimal period, they tend to atrophy, those brain processes atrophy, and can only be recovered later on at real cost. And so the development of a form of bringing in information purely through the emotional, relational, subtle energy brain system opens once we can shift our awareness up into the high roof brain and then we can start and employ uh, a kind of at liberty processes coming from the emotional, relational brain, which uh, the Australian Aborigine as a society over a period, now we know 40,000 years, has developed to a very high form this is what they call dream time cosmology itself and have all sorts of capacities that we really cannot explain at all. If you've ever spent any time with them, I've been back to, I've been two long lecture tours of Australia and I at least got some idea of what's going on among those people and they're awesome. They can, we can do things they can't do, but boy, can they do things we can't do. And the thing that Piaget was so amazed at and having had two whole families, different spread over a 35 year period, uh, I can vouch for this, having watched all my children growing up. When they hit these stages, it's overnight. And the change in their behavior is so awesome. It's so complete, so total. If you're just watching for it, 
And you don't read it into the child. The child is spelling it out to you very clearly. When they move from one of these processes to another, it's an absolute quantum leap. As Piaget made clear years ago, there's no way in the world you can add a previous structure up and it will give you the new behaviors which unfold overnight. Why? New brain processes fire in and each of these brain structures has within it its own intelligence, its own use of imagery, its own energy structure of the creative process itself, which is then available. And so we find at age seven, what can kids do once they can move up into the high roof brain if they're given a model for it? And I sat one night with a United States Army colonel, uh, a PhD, that's the new army, with 25 of us around him at the Monroe Center there in Virginia. And we ranged in age from five to 70. And this army colonel who'd been investigating all this for the army uh, had 23 of the 25 of us bending st uh, stainless steel into every conceivable shape. People were tying knives into all sorts of knots. Kids had, had corkscrewed the handles of forks all the way down in very tight corkscrews and so on and so forth. Uh, all this within a very few short minutes by just simply setting up a safe ambient for it. And of course, um, as, as we know, this is simply that because the high causal brain of incredible power can, through its kind of imagery process, completely revamp and change the emotional relational images of the midbrain, which then can act on the sensory motor brain and profoundly change the whole physical contour of things. And we've got a whole raft of very high level physicists who've been doing this, Bob Johns at Princeton University and so on. And my friend, the physicist at the University of Melbourne, who's been uh, bending bars of steel inside sealed glass cases by running his hands up and down it and so on. All this kind of stuff does go on at a later stage of development. Now, in the first 15 years of life, all of these great hierarchies of brain open up with one purpose in mind, to stabilize the physical process, to stabilize the child's sensory motor experience in the sensory world. That is to stabilize their physical bodies, ability to interact and survive a physical world out there. Everything in the first 15 years is toward that. The highest levels of intellect which are developed here in the last part of adolescence, I mean the middle part of adolescence. The highest structures of intellect are all designed by nature to deal only with physical process out here, analyzing it, taking it apart, putting it together in all sorts of brilliant ways, brilliant, playful ways. But it, now the adolescent has opening up within them two things, right about 13 to 14, 15, sexuality and another form of energy, both of which have remained latent or dormant until all the proper support systems are ready for them, right? Okay, now you have to, you can't open up the emotional relational brain until you've established the sensory motor brain. It's, it's, I mean, that's quite obvious. The emotional relational brain can't even operate until it has its information from the sensory motor brain to, to, to organize and, and, and uh, um, uh, orient around. And you certainly can't open up the high roof brain until both of these preliminary brains are, are operative by. The high roof brain has no access to outside information from the sensory world out here from his stimulus, from his models, except that translated to it through the translating mechanisms of the midbrain. So the, each support system must be established, and then it gives way to what? A higher evolutionary structure. And we know that each of the evolutionary structures, as they unfold, incorporate the previous structures into their own service. And so the previous structures, which are dominant, then become subdominant, and in effect give themselves over to a higher structure. If integration of the brain system takes place. Now, and that continues all the way up to about 15, and then the biological stage is over with. We've established our physiological system in this wonderful biosphere, this biological life, and this requires only the tiniest bit of this new brain to handle anything out here because it's a very stable and a rather restricted state. Then we open these two energies. Uh, one is sexuality, Genital sexuality, you've had preliminary forms of it before, but real sexuality, the ability to beget and conceive, has always throughout human history opened around 14, and it's parallel twin energy, which now we can use the word for, which we couldn't previously, because it was occultic and an embarrassment, it would be like saying Jesus at a cocktail party back in the 50s, uh, you know, or something like that, I'm thinking about faculty cocktail party. Uh, and. Uh, so we, we find this other energy, the twin of twin energy of sexuality, which opens up in adolescence once the support systems are ready for it. Remember the human ovary at birth 
has all those eggs on it, but seven million eggs, all complete and perfect and ready to go. But the system waits until all the support systems are ready before it starts dropping them down one at a time. So the whole app, all of these apparatuses are there in potential at birth, but await their respective time for unfolding until all the systems are ready for it. Gardner points out, he says, we know that all these great intelligences are in tact and perfect genetically at birth, but they must await their proper uh, respective time for unfolding when they, they're at their optimal period, and if you get, give the child the right stimulus, it unfolds. Uh, and the same thing with sexuality and its twin, which can now be talked about publicly, and that is that the twin is what we call kundalini energy. Now the and remember that in all the first 15 years, each process when it unfolds, incorporates all previous structures into that higher evolutionary structure. And the whole physical apparatus is meant by nature to be incorporated into the higher structures of mental and pure mental and pure abstract mental operations, which then unfold in the post-adolescent uh, period, which means that the whole ego structure is supposed to be integrated into a higher system in late adolescence. And it's at that point that you would have the integration of intellect into the intelligence. We make all of our, our uh, attention on just the development of intellect, and there's no integration of intellect into the intelligence of the bio system or the life system. As a result, intellect then can operate in a total vacuum without rela relating to other processes, without regard to how it, its activities relate to the well-being of the whole. And we're moving toward global suicide. And the only way to check it is what? somehow or other, get intellect um, integrated into the intelligence of the system again. And I think at one point it obviously was. And then in 1983, when that Presidential Commission came out, those three major studies on which the Presidential Commission on Education came out, it was, it was made clear that fully 50% of the American child population in our schools were not moving into, form op into operational thinking at age seven. They were not, as a result, moving into social bonding, which is locked into the genetic patterns at age six and seven. Social bonding is absolutely a genetic process, as McLean makes clear, and the kids are not making any movement in, into social bonding or the higher structures of intellect that should unfold at age seven. Where are they? They're locked into very preliminary forms of sensory motor identification and operation. We'll talk about that why in a minute. And the other most startling fact was the, that fully 70% of the American population over age 12 in our early teen population were functionally illiterate and uh, were not able to deal with any of what we had previously thought of as formal operational thinking. No semantic language structures were available to them, no abstract logic, um, uh, no, no capacities for grasping symbolic metaphoric thinking at all. They were locked into preliminary forms of sensory motor processing. And we found in 1983, 84, a serious epidemic outbreak of pregnancy in nine-year-old girls in America. And of course, at the same time, we have a serious, and I mean, this is really serious because 40 years ago, there were no incidences, and suddenly you've got many, many, many of them, uh, thousands of percentile increase, and a very serious outbreak of monarchy, the beginnings of menstruation at age eight throughout the American child population. It's one of the many contributing factors to the statement, the disappearance of childhood in America. Now, at the same time that this came out, uh, came out the fact that we had in 1983 and 84, a corresponding serious epidemic outbreak and increase of hostile, violent rape of females by males under age 10, which means nine-year-olds. So we find genital sexuality suddenly cropping up between age eight and nine and 10 on an ever greater level. There's a four-page uh, advertisement, a four-page article in the Houston Chronicle by the Associated Press on the need to set up emergency medical psychiatric clinics across the country to deal with the severe anxiety and depression in two-year-old children. Now, if you look at this limbic structure, this is where they call it limbic, L-I-M-B-I-C, or the, it's been called the emotional cognitive loop structure. Why? Because it's here that emotional energy acts on that sensory energy that gives us our cognition of our world out there. Now, if you activate the lowest parts of this emotional structure, remember, emotion means what? The quality of relationship. 
That's what emotion means. Activate the lowest parts of the emotional structure and you're activating that part where the two animal brains, the most ancient brains, come together, where they cooperate. They're very richly neurally connected with each other. Where the reptilian brain, the sensory motor brain, meets the emotional, relational, or mammalian brain that we share with all mammals. We know that if you activate the lowest parts of this limbic loop or the emotional cognitive structures, that it brings about a negative emotion in you. From very mild, where you're kind of uh, angry with your wife over the coffee in the morning, to that murderous rage that you want to pick up an automatic and go down to McDonald's and show the world that you're unhappy. Uh, from this, this whole, you see, this whole spectrum of negativity that can unfold on any level, unfolds by activating a specific part of the brain structure, where the two animal brains come together, okay? Now, we also know, it gives, we know that it gives the, in, in us a feeling of total isolation as an, as an isolated individual, not connected with anything. Immediately paranoia sets in. We feel that there's that out there and pour us in here. And immediately the adrenals start putting some kind of adrenaline into us, speeds up the heart rate, speeds up the breathing, our muscles tighten up, our jaws clench, and we're ready to do battle on some level, from a minor to the extreme. Burning can take place if you activate this highest part of the lowest part of the structure. Instead, all you get are a lot of atavistic, very primitive animal responses uh, that are antagonistic and so on. Activate the highest parts of the limbic structure, and what do you get? You get euphoria, joy, peace, love, all of the la-di-da Sunday school terms unfold with that, including the highest levels of intuition, pure intelligence, and creativity. They are all locked into this part of the brain structure. Now, McLean points out that all bonding, all bonding, takes place by activating the highest parts of the limbic structure. What does it mean by bonding? He refers to it. The relationship between the mother and the infant that's established at birth by activating these highest parts of the limbic structure. He speaks of the herd instinct that we refer to at age six and seven as the bonding to society, the social instinct, social ego that arises at age seven uh, and six and seven. It's brought about by a proper activation of the same bonding structure that unites us with our mother at infancy uh, when we're born into the world. What about the great pair bond of male-female? Uh, giving us at least the nucleus of our relationship sexually, as it has been practiced for thousands of years. It seems to be in a little trouble today. But uh, what is it that, that gives that pair bond of sexuality? An activation of the very same structure later on, provided what? That all the proper bondings have been made that lead up to that. And so on it goes. So we find that all relationship is determined by activating the highest parts of the structure, and if you do, the individual will report a peculiar sense of individuality, yes, but a feeling of unity with all other individuals, a feeling of belonging, of being a part, and an, an in, almost impossible for them to act against the social body because of a strange feeling that they act against the social body, they're acting against themselves. Because if you activate this in us, when you activate this highest part of the structure, you're activating that part where the limbic structure relates the two animal brain systems to the high brain. So immediately it incorporates your two primitive brains into the service of the highest of all evolutionary structures. Do you see what I mean? It integrates the two primary brains into service of the great human brain, and we go into a marvelous state of unity and wholeness and peace and joy and love and happiness and all the good things of life. And intelligence, of course, all the higher realms of intelligence. So, what determines which of those is activated? That should immediately be the biggest single issue in the world, shouldn't it? I mean, really, there's the whole key to everything. And all the evidence being presented from Europe backed this up right 100%. And I'm going to have to leave out all that research and just use one little bit of it. The work of John and Beatrice Lacey at Fells Institute under the auspices of the National Institute of Mental Health. And we find that the central core of the brain that furnishes the total ego structure that we have, our whole sense of I-ness or I-awareness, seems to translate through this mammalian brain structure. Not the new brain, but through here primarily, which of course is supposed to be integrated into service of this high brain. And our whole awareness of the world out there, our world structure, which is sensor motor, 
our intellectual structure, our ego structure, all that translating through here. And that this central core of the brain that is involved in most of the manufacturing of our consciousness has direct unmediated neural connections down to the heart thumping away in your chest. And that brain is sending its coordinate of all of its sum total of information gathered from all three brains to the heart instant by instant and receiving, quote, instructions from the heart of the response to make to the information. The heart is the major governor of all relationship in human experience. And there's not a person in this room who hasn't always known that intuitively on some level, right? I think of all the thousands of parents that I see every year and teachers. And they'll all say to me, you know, I feel I should do this with this child, but they tell me I should. Now watch that. What were the gestures? I feel I should do this, but they tell me. And we have all, of course, been totally conditioned from birth on to go entirely by they tell me or I think and ignore and deny at all cost, I feel. How many people really go on this rather than this? Very few. As a result, our relationships are pretty fouled up. Now, here's the thing about it. The heart is the governor of all relationship. And furthermore, the heart is the way by which Piaget's accommodation to information takes place. Now, it can only happen if certain biological rhythms established in utero are allowed to be maintained when the child comes into the world out here. And these biorhythms, these biorhythms that maintain the proper relationship between mind and heart are broken up and disappear very early in life in 97% of the American child population. I guarantee you that's the percentage right now. Uh, the other thing is that if it allows, is allowed to maintain this, this natural rhythm of m movement back and forth between these two processes, therein lies all brilliance and happiness and joy and peace and so on forth. Why? Because it activates the highest parts of the limbic structure and immediately you're getting integration of the brain system. Even in the early periods when the integration of the brain system as a totality must be spent in concentrating on establishing the sensory motor system first, the emotional relationship and so on. Even that requires total integration of the brain system. And when McLean says it categorically, that what has happened to our society today is a breakdown in the integration of these three major brain systems. They are at war within our heads. Our sensory motor brain, our sexual sensory brain is at war with our emotional brain. Our emotional brain is at war with our sensory brain. Our intellectual brain is at war with our emotional brain. And so on. We're kind of our own worst internal enemies and this is, this is expressed out there. What's the answer? Get back to the heart, and if that's not the corniest statement I've ever made, but it simply happens to be the truth. And so this connection with the heart is, a, is the major single thing in our whole life. Everything hinges on it, because the integration of the brain or the disintegration of the brain is contingent on what happens in heart-mind connections. And what do we find? Even in the connection between the heart and mind, in order to establish those connections and get them fully functional, what does the potential of this system require? It's proper stimulus in order to unlock that potential. You're back right again to your stimulus response model. And unless the stimulus comes from the proper model out there in the world to activate this incredible organize, organizational energy, emotional relational energy that relates everything together into its units of wholeness, unless that stimulus is given at the proper optimal period of time, you get disintegration and breakup of the brain structures itself. So now I'm going to just run through. See here at the same time that we're discovering who we really are, because who are we really? We're integral parts of the creative system. There is no possible chance of ever dividing you off from the creative system. You and the creative system are an integral unit. Any fragmentation is only an illusion of the system, as David Bohm calls it, a display of the illusion. So we and the creator, however you want to put it, any word will fit. It's not a semantic proposition. It's a biological function. We and the creative process, we and that which bring about the whole universal process, are an indivisible unit that can never be divided. But that total unity, which is literally broadcast, translated through the heart. The heart doesn't broadcast. The heart only translates it from its own field effect. But that total unity of the creative process and our individual ego awareness up there in the skull, the relationship between the universal process and the individual ego is the whole key to things. You see what I'm saying here?
And what has happened? Through a whole series of historical events, we've gotten split off from the true optimal function of heart-mind. As a result, we feel ourselves literally not only split off and isolated against each other, but split off and isolated from the whole creative process and, in effect, antagonistic to the creative process. And any word will fit. It's not a semantic proposition. It's simply the way the game is set up and the way it works. In time, five things that I can think of right off the bat have occurred within a 50-year period of history that never existed before in human history. Never existed before in human history. And all five have, as their final target of damage, which they brought about, the heart-mind connection, and primarily the specific damage to that reticular formation of the new brain that we call, I mean of the midbrain, that we call the limbic structure, the emotional cognitive structure. And all these things that we're looking on as moral, ethical breakdowns in our society are physical breakdowns within the structure of our brain. And we Secondly, get... intellect can never from here to eternity solve the problem. Why? Because it's a highly fragmented, highly detached, unrelated form of, of intelligence related to certain specific parts of the brain system for highly specific and sophisticated processes, which in themselves all operate once they have formed out of keeping with the, or out of sync with the whole system, in antagonism to the information from the heart. And intellect will never, from here to eternity, lead us out of the mess we're in right now. Intellect from here to eternity will never unfold the great potentials that are within us. This whole stimulus response process, what has recently been found is the vast majority of all this imprinting that takes place is beneath cognitive awareness. 90 to 97% of all of the learning and memory patterns built into the brain system, all the structures of knowledge, as PIJ calls them, take place beneath cognitive awareness in the child automatically as they imprint to our states of consciousness presented to the children. Which means less than five, uh, but let's say at the best, five percent of the total psychic energy of the child's brain system, the total psychic machinery giving them consciousness, less than five percent of it makes up what we think of as our conscious aware ego. Okay? <laughs> And so this means that 95% of all the learning that's ever taking place in the child is taking place by an automatic imprinting that we don't know is happening and the child doesn't know is happening. And so then we find, move into this one little interesting thing. All of us, without exception, with purity of heart, I mean, there's no, there's no blemish on this, want a better world for the child than we've had for ourselves. We don't want the child to know the fear, the anxiety, the hostility, the anger, the feeling of disappointment and bitterness that we've undergone. We don't want them to know the, the fear and terror that we undergo. We want a better world for our child. Now, we then immediately try to, the minute they can use language, we try to prescribe behavior to them that's our ideas of what would give a better world for the child, an intellectual process. We try to prescribe behaviors to them that will modify their behavior to make them conform to our ideas of what would give them a better world. Our parents did exactly that with each of us in this room, with all sorts of verbal directives. Do this, don't do that, etc. From the minute we can use language on. Now, all of that is generated by 5% of our conscious process, which we're aware of, that is our ordinary ego awareness, using verbal means to address 5% of the child's structure, right? Can't be more than 5% of the child's structure. Telling them the behaviors with, that would give them a better world. Meanwhile, 95% an average, let's say, taking it from the research, of all the child's structures of knowledge are simply automatic imprinting according to the nature, the character, and the quality of the models presented. On a physical level, the great physical energies unfold their potentials according to the model out here, the stimulus response process. On emotional levels, and boy, do we know this is true, that is, you can't hide your emotional state from your child. They live in your emotions. As Jung said, they live in the shadow of your consciousness. Uh, they must try desperately to follow the model's instructions of behavior. But the models of behavior that we're giving them on prescriptions are radically different from the states we have because we want a better state for them than ours, you see. So what they're imprinting to with 95% of the system is totally different from what we're telling them over here. And they try desperately to do both of them. They have to imprint automatically, non-consciously, non-aware, 
to the imprints with 95% of the system, and they try desperately to do what we're telling them. But of course, that's 5% of the system fighting what 95% of the system is automatically doing. What do we find actually happening? Is that on the way to school, the child is automatically imprinting to every billboard, they're imprinting to every rock star, they're imprinting to every sports star, they're imprinting to every political star, every newspaper, every television, every movie, every image that they see, they're imprinting to every state of consciousness, every emotional ambient that they move through automatically with 95% of the system. And then the teacher is going to get them for two or three hours a day and addressing 5% of their system is going to somehow or other miraculously offset the other 95%. Do you see what I'm talking about? And then we pillory the teachers and blame them for the massive uh, a, a failure uh, to, to do properly. And when the child cannot possibly be addressing 5% of the system offset what's going on with 95% of the imprinting, we accuse them of moral, ethical failure to shape up. What's the matter with these kids after all we've given them? You see. Now... The issue is, it's this split that does as much damage. If we simply went ahead and insisted the child be as mad as we were, the system would be intact. But it's this great split that hurts as much as anything else. Now, my teacher, Chivala Sananda, my teacher, Guru Mai, one of the great women saints, I, without doubt, the greatest women saint of history, and one of the most powerful people that has ever hit the scene on this earth, says, until that which you are thinking, that which you are feeling, and that which you are acting and speaking are a single integrated unit, you are robbed of all of your own power, are living in a fragmented reality, and simply fragment every child you even come into proximity with. You don't even have to have anything to do with the kid. Just pass him on the street and he's imprinting to your states of awareness. Okay, now I can tell you this that the only way that the current crisis of childhood can be healed is to heal the models they're following. It can't start with children. You're not going to come up with a better curriculum in your schools. You're not going to come up with a new behavior modification system. You're not going to come up with getting tough with those kids or any of that. The only way to change the current downhill move and collapse of childhood is to change the models they're following. That means the adults must somehow or other be changed. Now the next thing is intellect can't do it. What can do it? Only a return to that heart. Only that can bring about the change that must be changed because the heart is the, the literally a universal conscious process which can relate everything together properly and that's what brings about the integration of that brain structure. Thank God our, our way out of the current Real crisis, and boy, it's a lot worse than you might know here. I spend uh, uh, generally at least four and sometimes six months a year overseas in other countries. And when I come back to the United States, and I mean as somebody who dearly loves this place, I got homesick for it when I'm away. When I come back, I undergo cultural shock. The level of anxiety and the level of rage, the anger level in America, and the anger in our children, the anger in our schools, where we had 87,000 violent attacks on teachers by students, registered on police blotters, had one million children hospitalized from brutal beatings by their parents, and the average age of those hospitalized children was two weeks to two years. This is what McLean calls clear indication of a breakdown in the species instinct for survival. 2,000 of the children died in hospitals. 5,000 were killed outright by their parents in homes. And what do we find? It's all within that limbic structure. McLean says we even know the very parts of the brain that are involved in that kind of, of behavior. But what is it that it's really brought about is the breakup of the heart process. Five major reasons that happened historically all within a 50-year period. They're real simple. For the first time in human history, and no society has ever done this before, none. In the 30s, we violated age 7 as the absolute sacrosanct period, 6 and 7, 6 to 7, of what Piaget called the dreaming intuitive child, in which they're living out the world of the dream in pure play, the only way by which the brain can be finally integrated before the great movement into intellect at age 7 
We violated with high-level abstract process. Hit the we violated age seven, the great period when we know the child's entire worldview is shaped by qualitative aesthetic response. That is by their emotional relations with their world out there. When Kagan found down there in Guatemala recently that some of these children from extreme deprivation, I mean, they didn't have enough to eat, they had no clothes, uh, they were in grass uh, shacks uh, on dirt floors living like pigs, but he found, given the slightest chance to learn, they were brilliant, that they had an incredible intelligence, that they could outlearn our kids ten to one. Why? Because they had a very rich quality of life. What is life in the first seven years of a child? 100% of it is their relationship with their parents and their family. Relationship. The quality of relationship is the way the whole structure of intelligence unfolds in the first seven years, and it's profoundly important from seven to eleven. Now, in our country, where we provide them with a very high standard of living, no one asks, but what is the quality of life for that child? Because the quality of life is determined 100% by their emotional relations with parent, family, and society. And in those statistics, this is the last one I'm going to throw out, 70% of all American children under age four are in daycare centers being cared for by someone else other than their parents. And we know now from brain research that the basic model on which all imprints are built up in the structure of knowledge of world, self, and the relationship between the two in the first four years is based squarely on the parent. But then in the 1940s, we did something which had been in motion for a long, long time. And that is suddenly with 96% of all births in America, a radical revolution took place within a single year. And that is, we began to break up all the genetic bonding processes between mothers and infants at birth in 96% of all American cases in hospital technological childbirth practices. Up until that time, only 30% of the population were born in hospitals to begin with, and suddenly 96% of them are born in hospitals, and because of all sorts of wartime emergency processes, Technological processes were, were introduced into the natural uh, development of, I mean, the natural process of, of birth, which had never been used before, and you introduced all sorts of new intellectual interferences with the natural genetic system of birth, and all of them set about to break up the, the bonding function, which is between mind and, uh, and heart. And, I, and that is when the system, because of the breakup of the proper relationship between the three modes, the newborn gets locked into a sensory motor mode from which it never fully moves again. And only frag fragments of the psychic structure get integrated into the higher structures or the higher evolutionary systems, but the majority of it remains locked into sensory motor process. And we end up with an id at war with an ego at war with the superego, to use Freudian terms, or McLean simply say, we end up locked into a sensory motor system which incorporates the other processes into its own service, and the system is split all to pieces. The third major effect directly spins out of that in the breaking up of the bonding structures, as because the work of, of Kennel and Klaus, their brilliant medical doctors, have been working for 30 years on this. We know that the behavior patterns of the mother are radically altered by the bonding structures because her heart changes the way her brain is operating when she's given skin-to-skin -skin contact of the infant at birth and maintains ongoing contact with that infant and changes her whole behavior pattern from that point on. If she's denied this access, her behavior pattern will be totally different from it. I'll just simply say that one of our most sacrosanct institute institutions in the United States, male surgical obstetrical practice, is the most damaging and destructive single force on earth today and is the major... <laughs> is the major single force that's going to bring about the destruction of the whole species, unless it's curbed, unless it's checked. Right now, there's not much chance of that. It's a $50 billion a year industry, and right now, they're simply putting every midwife they can, they can get hold of out of business, right and left, and putting them in jail in mass numbers, really. I've been asked to testify at midwife trials all over the United States. And, but I will pass on this one thing. If you, do, if you bring a little infant up in, a, in a, a serious brainwashing process, there's not much chance they're going to think any other way. And our people have been brainwashed by one of the most massive fear techniques known of 
in, in the universe that's ever been employed uh, for uh, obstetrical uh, practices in hospitals. But nevertheless, it must, by some future historian, seem strange that a, a whole generation after generation after generation of women have surrendered millions of years, millions of years, of genetically encoded instinctual processes and the tremendous power, the incredible power of being the mother of the species and controlling the whole process of life and death in this world, have surrendered that over to a group of male surgeons and allowed themselves to be mutilated, insulted, uh, and, and, and treated in very strange, macabre fashion over a period of many, many years at the rate of a $50 billion a bill, year bill for it must prove one of the strangest phenomena in history. Now, one last little thing on that, and that is, and I can back this up, in fact, we have massive statistics for this, home birth under midwifery is exactly 600% safer than hospital birth under any circumstance. There are six times more deaths in hospitals, births, than home births right across the board in all technological countries. Okay. I'll just throw that out. And of course you hear exactly the opposite. Something might go wrong. I guarantee you in the hospital something always goes wrong. Uh, ne nevertheless, of course, the women, the people who've done the greatest studies on this were women doctors. And I can guarantee you for 30 years all their evidence has been massively ignored by the AMA because what do women after all know about childbirth? Now, then we move on to the final little thing here, and I'm going to close with this, really. I can't get into all of the issues tonight. I'm just throwing them out, and I'm not giving any of my evidence for it. But the final thing is the effects of television. Now, everyone thinks the effects of television on the child has to do with content. Content has nothing in the world to do with the damage that television does on the American child. For reasons I can't possibly go into in this short of time, the 6,000 hours that the average American child sees viewing television before age five when they're then put into kindergarten and expected to handle high-level abstract symbol systems, those 6,000 hours, in fact, it, only takes, uh, it doesn't take any time at all much to do it at all, <coughs> have systematically and effectively prevented the growth of a symbolic metaphoric structure in the limbic system. What television does is it furnishes the brain with a combination of waveform sound processes with imagery. And what the symbolic metaphoric system, the only way it can develop through all the standard practices used throughout human history in play, fantasy, let's pretend, storytelling, and I really would love to go into all that, uh, with the child, Vygotsky's studies on this were so beautiful, uh, he died a long time, and Luria's studies, and, and, and so on. The, um, child's development of symbolic metaphoric structures in their limbic system are the limbic system's ability to produce an image in response to certain stimuli. And if the stimuli are given out here, immediately the limbic structure, which relates everything together, the emotional relational brain, and which thinks in metaphors and symbols, which at night have free flow in our dreams, the metaphoric symbolic structure of that which is necessary for development the response to that potential is brought about by the proper stimulus being given. And that has historically, throughout human history, been through the play, let's pretend, fantasy, storytelling, and so on. I can't go into all the rich ramifications of it from the model out here, the parent. And what television did, first of all, it supplanted this parental-child interaction. You don't get it in 70% of your American uh, uh, family life. The television is supplanted. The other 30%, thank God, or we would have no literacy left at all, are those parents where the child both sees television and they have interaction with the parent in play, storytelling, fantasy, uh, bedtime uh, stories, and so on and so forth, which is enough to activate the process and they can create these internal images. The little girl who said she loved radio so much more than television because the pictures were so much more beautiful, simply because the pictures are created within the, the, the symbolic structures of the midbrain and her survival is at stake. Because, of course, an ego structure that is fragmented between the three brains and can't be integrated is an ego structure at severe risk. And the only way to integrate the three brain systems in their, in their use of imagery is to develop the symbolic 
uh, structures of the midbrain. Our 70% functional illiteracy, what do we mean by that? On the sensory motor level, the child can handle all the symbols of the alphabet and even speak the right words and so on. But they have no comprehension of what they're doing at all. Why? Because you must transfer the imagery from its uh, sensory motor brain to the high level abstract brain of the intellect. And the only way to transfer them is through the transference symbols, that means metaphoric symbols, of the midbrain, and they have not developed in 70% of the children. So the content of television has not anything to do with it. Television floods the system with a synthetic counterfeit of the response the system is supposed to make to the stimuli. When you feed both the stimuli and the response in on a, on a sensory motor level, you get a disastrous result. Radio had exactly the opposite effect. In fact, families sitting around listening to radio, there is strong evidence that they even shared the same imagery because the limbic structure starts drawing out of the same pools of emotional uh, uh, energy. Enough for all that. The child could compensate for any one of these. And they've all happened within a very short period of historical time. And every one of them, of these effects, has brought about damage to what? the natural genetic process of integrating those three brains. And as I say, then we accuse the child of moral ethical failure for measuring up to all of our standards, and we've done so much for them. The other thing I might throw out is toys. We know, and one of the good things of Burton White at Harvard, among all the nonsense he's turned out, one good thing he did was he said the manufactured toy really seriously damages the production of these internal images that we call imagination, on which all development is really based. And we flooded the child with manufactured toys now to, to a very strange, literally a very strange, irrational level. And if you now look for the past 20 years, all these manufactured toys are simply replicas of the images which they're seeing on television. So that the only imagery processes they're all having to deal with are exterior processes. So all my old teaching colleagues, I used to teach in college, all my old teaching colleagues are pulling out of things like teaching high-level mathematics and all because they say the kids, there's no way in the world they can teach them anymore to the majority of the college students. Why? They have no way to grasp symbolic structures. So on with the dope. So content has nothing to do with the damage of television. Again.